I want us to become brothers again like we used to be, and for us to find ourselves and bond with each other. Can we agree to that? Opinions vary. Welcome to Three Brothers Filmcast, a monthly roundtable podcast where the brothers behind threebrothersfilm.com have substantial, nuanced conversations about film. I'm Aaron Bergstrom, and I'm here with my brothers. Anders. And Anton. My last name is the same as my brother's. And we're plugging back into The Matrix to talk about Lana Wachowski's The Matrix Resurrections. We'll also dig into Adam McKay's controversial political satire, Don't Look Up. And finally, we'll spend some time remembering filmmaker Peter Bogdanovich and acting legend Sidney Poitier, who both died earlier this month. But first, thanks so much for listening and joining us on our journey through film. We've made it to 2022, and we couldn't have done it without the support of our listeners. If you want to help grow the show... Five-star ratings, social media shares, and reviews of the show do a lot to expand our reach and bring new listeners to the podcast. As well, if you've enjoyed our conversations here and our writing at threebrothersfilm.com, please consider supporting us on Patreon. And now, on to the show. Okay, ramblers, let's get rambling. Thomas? You seem particularly triggered right now. Can you tell me what happened? I've had... Dreams that weren't just dreams. Am I crazy? We don't use that word in here. The Matrix Resurrections is a movie that shouldn't exist. Or at least, that's the sense you get when watching it. And that's not necessarily a criticism. The story of Keanu Reeves' as Neo and Carrie Ann Moss's Trinity wrapped up pretty definitively in 2003 with the two sequels, The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions. Those films concluded with an armistice between humankind and their machine overlords. Neo and Trinity even died at the end, sacrificing themselves to bring about some semblance of peace. And yet, here we are, with the fourth film in the influential science fiction series, and Neo and Trinity back in The Matrix, alive and well and acting as if the previous films never happened. They aren't supposed to be here, and yet, in contemporary pop culture, things cannot stay dead. Every old franchise is brought back to life. And so it was only a matter of time before Neo and Trinity were back on our screens, and The Matrix was turned back on. What makes The Matrix Resurrection so strange is that it engages with the artificial resurrection of the franchise within the film itself. It's about as meta as these legacy sequels can get. In the film, Neo is Thomas Anderson, a famous game developer who made a trilogy of influential video games called, you guessed it, The Matrix. He's now tasked to develop a new sequel in the franchise, and as he goes about interrogating his past work, or in reality his past life, he also struggles with a nagging feeling that his life isn't real. Eventually, Jessica Henwick's Captain Bugs and Yahya Abdul-Mateen II's new Morpheus enter Neo's world and tell him, no, you're not delusional. He is living inside a simulation, and he does need to wake up and free himself from its clutches. And Neo once again chooses to take the red pill and see reality for what it is, if only so he can save Trinity from the Matrix's clutches. From there on out, the film becomes more conventional, repeating some elements of the earlier films as it charts Neo's quest to rescue Trinity and destabilize this new Matrix that has been created since his death and resurrection. There are slow motion action scenes, romantic moments between Neo and Trinity, appearances of some characters from the old trilogy, such as Jada Pinkett Smith as Niobe in some pretty awful old age makeup. And there's also new versions of characters from the old films, such as Abdul Mateen's new Morpheus, and Jonathan Groff as a new version of Agent Smith. Neil Patrick Harris even plays a new version of the architect known as the Analyst. But the film is arguably more interesting in the section before Neo wakes up, where it interrogates the meaning of the series itself and flirts with some pretty heady existential territory. I was amused to see how themes explored in Rodney Asher's documentary A Glitch in the Matrix, which tells the stories of several men who believe they are living in a computer simulation, show up in this film. The original Matrix film convinced some unstable young men that the real world was simply a computer simulation. The existence of the Matrix within this delusion was not necessarily an escape route, but simply an acknowledgement of the facts of existence. And now, the new Matrix movie is the Matrix existing within its world, seemingly arguing that self-awareness, and material reality are meaningless in our modern world, which is all about repetition, digital servitude, existential dysfunction, and our pathological desire to ignore the discomforts of the real. A telling moment comes later in the film when Neo attempts to free Trinity and falls into the analyst's trap. The analyst gloats and tells Neo that people don't want to be free. All they want is the illusion of freedom and a bit of comfort and they're happy to live in servitude. It's a variation of Cypher's comments in the original film, where he says the steak tastes real and that's enough for him. 
Whether you like The Matrix Resurrections and this latest take on the material that was and remains so mind-blowing in the original film from 1999, I think it's undeniable that it's trying to be provocative, and it uses its narrative and thematic repetitions to make some comment about the world, or at least the pop culture world we're living in. But whether it's successful as a movie and a worthy sequel to The Matrix, which I did call the definitive movie the past two decades during our retrospective in 2019, well, that's up for debate. I've already posted a positive review on the website where I talked about it as a mostly intriguing and successful rehashing of elements of the trilogy, so followers of Three Brothers film already know my take. Uh, but what about you guys? Let's start with you, Anton, because I suspect you're less enamored of the film than me, or even Anders, and I certainly know that you're less of a fan of the sequel films in general. So, mm -hmm. is The Matrix Resurrections an interesting remix of an influential science fiction story? or another example of pop culture cannibalizing itself. Well, I think it's both, and I think there's a there's some brilliant stuff stuck in what I consider kind of a bad movie. Overall, I didn't like the movie. There was parts that I thought were terrible, but there was portions of it that I thought were like fascinating, and a lot of your descriptions and positive descriptions in the intro here and in your review really just focus in I think on some of those best elements. Um, for me, from the get-go, uh, the way it's structured deflates its provocative possibilities. And we can talk more about what I mean by that. But so overall, I was disappointed, even though I'm not a big fan of the sequels, um, but a huge fan of the first Matrix. You think the movie is like a true mixed bag then, Anton, right? I, I think it's a true mixed bag, and my overall feeling of the film is negative. I would give it a okay. negative review. Um, Overall, I don't like it, but there's some material in it that I actually really like. Okay. So, Anders, where, where do you land? I mostly liked the movie, but with some serious enough misgivings to want to revisit it and think about where it fits, one, into the overall Matrix franchise and also uh, our, our contemporary remake, you know, pop culture moment. One of the things that I was maybe the most critical of in it was it's, you know, do we need another Matrix? Because I, I am of the opinion that the, the third one wrapped things up very nicely. And it's sort of something that, like I said in my review of The Force Awakens for our Star Wars uh, retrospective, that to create a new sequel to something that actually has resolution requires the undoing of the happy ending, undoing of resolution, the undoing of stasis, which is a very strange thing to do thematically considering the, you know, Matrix Revolutions was literally not about a revolution per se, but the cycles of death, rebirth, mm -hmm. yeah. of, and all these kind of things. So, like, I'm not really sure what the point of a fourth one is. And I think that, you, like, your introduction here, which says this movie probably shouldn't exist, and it's aware of that. But I guess I'm not sure that self-reflexivity is enough to save it on a conceptual level entirely. It, th I think that's interesting comment. So I think we can all agree that the, the meatiest part of the movie, the, mo the part of the movie that is most worth digging into is that nice 30-minute sequence about 10 minutes into the film and then f to 45 minutes where it's just following Thomas Anderson, like Neo, exactly. around his life mm -hmm. in the Matrix. And it gets weird because it has so many parallels to nowadays. Well, well it is. Clearly, yeah. like, they've moved. Like, he's no longer in a Chicago Manhattan. He's in San Francisco, yeah. right? It's today the, the use of cell phones the and even the... The barista that he yeah, goes coffee to. Shops. Yeah, but, it, it's, but it's not just that. It's that I think... I think you're correct in diagnosing my um, take on the film, Anton, and I don't think you and me would necessarily disagree hugely about the film. It's just we weigh the different elements of it differently. Like, I weigh this element far, I think, greater. Like, I like the sequence so much that I'm willing to overlook some of the other stuff I don't like, which I'll get to. But here's the problem is that, for me, um, that, that like, I think you're right. That's the, the meatiest and best part of the film is the whole sequence where it's like, okay, here's Thomas Anderson again. What's going on? Is this Neo? But the whole thing for me is that that's deflated because we've already know that this is, is like the no, Matrix. Because of the and, opening and I frame just wish, with bugs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If they had just 
I was just, I was so annoyed that they, like, wouldn't actually be super daring and be like, the, what was brilliant about the trailer was that when you watched the trailer, you were like, what is going on here? Is that Neo? Why is he back in the Matrix not knowing what's going on? And it never gives us that within the film. So I have a thought about why that might be. Because it from the start. Oh. What's your thought, Anders? My point is that it can't perhaps chose not to be as daring as the original film because remember that one of the appeals of the original film was the whole tagline what is the matrix you know and yep. nobody you have to experience it for yourself and the opening of the film even with you know the the scene that this film repeats with trinity escaping from the agents and stuff you were not entirely sure as a viewer what was going on here you know why is she able to do these martial arts why is she not in the rubble of the, the destroyed uh, thing? So it sets up a mystery, right? And then we're introduced to Thomas Anderson and his increasingly strange experiences until at the moment when he takes the red pill and goes through, then you actually are, you know, then Neo gives his great little expository piece. This film, perhaps they didn't want to repeat that, but it, you're right, it's exactly deflating because it already sets up, you know, it's like you're acknowledging defeat before you even begin. Right, but it's saying. partly because... And that's thematic in the movie too, right? This idea that you, you can't go, go back in that sense and, and just redo the same thing, that it's cliche, it's self-aware, that you know, they're literally making a, a new Matrix movie in the world right, or but a it, new game. Yeah. But it's partly that Lana's opted to um, put emphasis on sort of like other meta aspects. Mm -hmm. Like within that whole, whole opening sequence where we think we're re-watching the beginning of the first Matrix movie, where there's like a trinity in the room and the, and the agents are coming. So the film opts to replay that portion again, but you're like, is that is that satisfying or useful enough that it it uh, it's more important to include that opening sort of redo sequence where Bugs is like, oh, like what's going on? Is this a modal? Um, instead of really giving us uh, aligning the viewer with Neo Thomas Anderson, like I think that's for me the problem is then that makes um, the audience align more with Bugs and mm -hmm. less with Neo Thomas Anderson, and I just feel like the film itself would have been more powerful if we had actually been able to experience Neo's questioning of like what the hell is going on, like am I losing my mind? But I don't think that it. We never really fully believe that part. I don't know. Yeah, but I don't think that would work, right? Because we've already done that plot. And, and we are the stand-in for Bugs because Bugs is watching. We are the fans. They're the ones who know the story of Neo that but, has been taught to them but, over and over again. But and we so wouldn't, we, it makes we would sense wonder to why is Neo, But like, what I, I guess what I'm saying is it gets rid of the real mystery of why is Neo back in the Matrix. But it which, does. Which was so... It, it, yeah, but you can't repeat... The, the part of the thing with this movie is like you can't go home again. That's like part of the huge part of it. it. It's baked into the story of Thomas has to make a new Matrix, and it's the whole Warner Brothers is going to make it with or without you. Are you in? And that clearly was Lana Wachowski's whole thing. It's like, I don't want somebody else missing, messing with Neo and Trinity as characters. So if we have to do a Matrix, I want to do my weird meta riff on it. And that's the only way I'm going to you're I'm gonna let you make a movie in this climate. And so this is why, I, off the top, I'm like, this movie probably shouldn't exist. But the nature of our pop culture is that, of course, it's going to exist. Her hand so was forced. Kind, so what kind of film are you going to get? And I can imagine a straight reboot that plays the same thing again and feels extremely hollow. But it, I would rather have something like this, which actually does things that are already present a bit in Reloaded and Revolutions about talking about like cyclical nature of things. The, yes. the fact that this the, the, the quest of the chosen one itself is like a construction meant to uh, make these characters um, decisions simpler within their lives when the, the actual decisions are not particularly simple but i think like, you're both remember you're both... revolution doesn't end with a happy ending no but you're both suggesting that somehow if we had that that great 30 minute sequence um following thomas anderson that that would be a replay of the beginning of the matrix but it wouldn't be because because it, we know who keanu reeves is like, you know, we know who Neo is. And also he's making the Matrix. Like there, w there was already so much stuff within that sequence that would, would not just do be a straight replay. And you really would start to question whether, you know, um, whether Lana is basically saying like, wait a second, are they saying that the, the earlier three movies were just video games? Like it could, you could really do a real serious movie head trip. 
and they opt instead to do what I consider not actually the most um, amazing meta, but for me, this is just, this is just, um, it's equivalent, it's a little bit better, a little bit smarter, but it's equivalent to Jurassic World, in that the meta is <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> used there as both a, a deflection on the reason for the sequel, but it actually also has some good, smart things to say. I always thought it was great in Jurassic World, where they have Jaws, and, you know, uh, we always have to have a bigger monster. It, it, and it's doing those things, um, and it, it worked, but at the same time, the movie can't overcome the fact that it's sort of, like, forced. And I, I, I actually think, that for me, that uh, Resurrections is more similar to Jurassic World than, like, a really smart meta riff. Okay, so I I think I mostly agree. Like, I I want to be clear about my my positive assessment of this movie, which is I find it intriguing enough, given the environment that we're in, in terms of pop culture. Yeah. I was not... A, I don't think... Um, I do not think that Matrix Revolutions is, like, an amazing movie. I think it's a really challenging movie, and it's most interesting in the ways that it refuses to give a happy ending, and the way that it pulls it away, the themes of the series, away from what is implicated in the first movie. But that's not necessarily satisfying or like great art it's just intriguing and one of the most intriguing elements i find in this whole matrix story world is the way that it forces you to confront questions of like existential meaning about what exactly is reality and it not on like a story level of like is this a computer simulation or not this is why i brought up a glitch in the matrix in mm -hmm. my intro and that movie was so stuck in my head where i'm like there's no way that wachowski hasn't seen this movie and worked, or is aware of these stories, and worked that into, like, this section of, this meta section of the movie, where, like, it's, it's some, it's provocative and kind of terrifying to think about this movie as being, like, oh, the, the hero in this movie parallels all the people in real life who think the Matrix, or, like, I know what the Matrix is, and the Matrix is my key to understanding that everything is meaningless, and I have to double down on my own meaning, that I create out of it and the relationships I have in that it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an act of such like intense solipsism that even though I don't agree with it, like personally, yeah. I find it fascinating to find in a movie like this. And so I'm willing to be like, okay, I'll go would, along with yeah. this. <laughs> but I would also say that the interesting meta aspect of like both revolutions and resurrections to some degree, which begins at the end of reloaded with the architect's speech one of the most interesting implications of that is it turns away, it still does the thing that the first movie does, which you know, question your reality to some degree, but not in the, the sort of banal Descartesian, uh, you know, demon illusion idea that the world is, is, is an illusion and that there's some sort of Gnostic truth, but it actually moves it, and this maybe Anton also can, might be explain why you didn't love it, but more toward a kind of a notion that many of the myths and stories uh, of both ancient times, but also now with this movie, our own moment and the way that, uh, you know, we cannibalize pop culture and, and reboot things and all that, all of these things might in some way be kind of like socio-cultural loops mm -hmm. and yeah. programs that we act out in order to give meaning to things, right? And that they may, maybe they're not designed by a malicious uh, god or a malicious... Uh, AI, but rather um, they're, they're like essentially survival strategies that, that human beings have evolved to, to structure, which is sort of nihilistic in some sense in suggesting that there's no real underlying meaning other than like a uh, Darwinian survival to some degree. But I, so that in that sense, I think the movie is not just some sort of like making fun of the, some of the to be honest, sort of hokey. Uh, almost dorm room uh, conversations and something like a glitch in the <laughs> matrix, right? Yeah. I, and I found that film really interesting, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Yep. So this is that this is that would be sort of my defense of the thematic yeah. quality of this movie. I mean, like you're you're right that like you know, I think about the Matrix sequels and I think uh, Resurrection fits in. They're they're like the last Jedi to uh, the other Star Wars movies. You know, that's how I. Like, there's something about their approach to undoing the hero's journey um, that I kind of just detest. Um, sure, because they're literally saying the hero's journey is just a yeah. program, an algorithm yeah. that you're living every yeah. time. Yeah. But there's also a weird, then, it creates a weird tension between the first work and then, like, the, the next one, um, where it's like, 
right? There's like an oppositional energy between them. Mm -hmm. Um, Totally. Set and setting, right? Oh, no. It's all about set and setting. After our first contact went so badly, we thought elements from your past might help ease you into the present. Nothing comforts anxiety like a little nostalgia. So I think we all agree that there is a really good sequence in this movie. But can we also just talk about how bad some other parts are? And for me, like, you know, like, that's the thing is just that, like, you know, at the end of the day, Lana didn't make the, uh, the narrative structure I would have chosen. But like, again, right, like, that's not that's not how criticism just works. You know, you don't have to do what I want. Mm -hmm. But but then there's just also stuff that's just like bad and like for me i was having flashes and i guess because david mitchell's involved i was thinking this movie's more like cloud atlas than it's like <laughs> the first matrix and i'm getting really bothered because there's like why do i have like a, a why is the merovingian become a gremlin now like what is going on here and like i'm having flashbacks okay, so- of the gremlin hugo weaving and cloud atlas and i was just like this is not the matrix i want and where is my good martial arts yes Ain't no blade can protect you from the true truth. Can I do, like, a rapid-fire thing with you a bit? Like, okay. and Andrews, you can do this too, but, like, I'm going to hit some things, and it's, like, good or bad. And it's, it's new characters and whatnot. Okay. But we'll, we'll get into the action in a bit, because I think that is, yeah. without a doubt, the key weakness in the movie. So you said Merovingian and that whole sequence. I think we all agree. So uh, Io and old Niobe. Horrible. <laughs> Why can't they do old person makeup? I, I, I was flipping through Netflix the other day and I saw Bad Grandpa or something and it was they, it's with Johnny Knoxville and I'm like, they why literally is that trick the-? real people? No, but I'm like, that is much better makeup than I see in most movies for old age and I don't get it. Why can't or why can't you just do Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, just like put a little bit on? I don't know. Maybe the like, same Matrix person or sorry, maybe the same makeup person also did Cloud Atlas, which was Likely. also kind of shoddy um, <laughs> in, in doing sort of like people's faces and like different ages and stuff. Okay. Bugs. What's your take on Bugs as a character? Eh, neutral to me. W- Wanna be First Matrix. See, I, I kind of like her, mainly because I just think the actress has a kind of like a genuine earnestness to it that it works for that kind of observer role that's our surrogate. Yeah. It's not like she has tons of stuff to do, but I, I like the actress. I think that's why I'm neutral on the characters, because I see it purely as this like fan standing kind yeah. of character. Um, what about the new Morpheus, Yaya Abdul Mateen? really bad i think he's a charming actor but i'm not sure how it handles the resurrection of morpheus as an ai i'm not i don't i don't know what was going on why is why is morpheus holding a martini like what there's just like these additions where it's like i don't know if it's having fun or if it's just like are you trying to just like totally mess with the first he's he's a super charismatic actor and he's like super handsome and wears a suit really well and he looks cool with like the orange suit and the two guns and stuff but i think what it is is that it's a bit of like filmmaker being intoxicated with the swagger and you're like you don't have to have this character as morpheus (laughs) you could have just had this character because he's he's not even wearing the suits that morpheus would (laughs) have worn uh, an ai fan uh counterpart to yeah. bugs yeah which is what the character becomes it really isn't morpheus in some sense exactly it's it's really yeah. just the ai character yeah um what about bringing back um sati the the robot yep. girl from the third one as like a physical embodiment between where she switches I, between i the like that i like how that when she's in the real the real world she's like this like robot creature okay, wait 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 and, stuff. Um, and then and then when she's she in, in the, the matrix she's, she's the, the little girl in the, the little girl station. at the end the little uh, oh yeah uh, yeah, yeah her okay. family the indian family yep. that are yep. in the and she's like a big part of the good robots that yep. work with them that's fine but again like i don't i don't cla- love i the, think that's neat yeah because I, I like i like the blurring of the um robots on both sides exactly kind of thing. i i have this thing right what one of my biggest grievances with uh the matrix reloaded in revolutions is that slowly the matrix turns into tron <laughs> and so I just do not like, like, sort of program world. Like, I, I'm, I'm not big on that. And I think Tron actually I, does that just as fun. Well, it would have been great if there was yeah, light cycles. But, come on, so, Tron's awesome. No, but, but yeah, yeah. So, like, okay, you know, like, having that character and then you're right, the, the sort of the real world uh, robot. That, I think that works. Like good robots? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then the two other big ones, I think. Jonathan Groff as, like, New Smith. <sighs> I, let's say yes to Jonathan Groff. And basically his whole performance, but there's no reason that he needs to be Smith. And there's a big, dis- there's a huge difference in how they do um, enunciation. 
that just makes it not work. Hugo Weaving like spits out all of his words and uh, Jonathan Groff actually he pulls air in when he speaks. And so there's a weird so like smooth. inversion of how they speak that like that's that's for an me, interesting observation of the performance. I like that. But he, but it's so for me it's like he's not there's not even enough um, echoing of Hugo Weaving or again. Couldn't we just have Jonathan Groff be some sort of interesting character? Uh. I forget who said it on online, but they made a comment about like how funny would Matrix Resurrections be if Hugo Weaving was his like <laughs> Thomas Anderson's boss, being like, "We gotta make a new game." Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> have you made a new game, like, Mr. Anderson. Anderson? Warner Brothers wants us to work, Mr. Anderson, because <laughs> everything he says sounds so menacing. Uh. <laughs> And, and then the other big one is is Neil Patrick Harris is like the new architect type character. He, I think he's actually the, of the new characters. Yeah. He works really really well in the world of the film. And he oh, yeah. and he might actually um, be an improvement on the other architect, the architect. who I never really liked. Who I said love the way he insinuates himself into Neo's life. You mean Colonel yeah, yeah. Sanders, right? Yeah, I, I think no, he so, was actually really good. I liked it. I so can it. we pull a little thread here? Pull a little thread just in the conversation with yeah. the analyst character. This is where the existential stuff, I think, gets most intriguing, not just because he involved in this meta sequence, but it is the stuff that I bring about in the intro of, like, people don't want to be, you know, people want to mm-hmm. be comfortable, people want to be s- slaves, ultimately, to something or another. And the fact that it's couched in therapeutic culture, mm-hmm. the fact mm-hmm. that it's couched in him being like, you are... Your delusions are holding you back from conforming to the world, which exactly. you know is wrong. But the fact that if we took this into a real world and we had somebody having the same delusions as Thomas Anderson, would be like, you should never, ever, ever encourage this stuff. It's like, but you know, the world we all live in is horribly dysfunctional, and everything they're diagnosing, even if it's not some kind of demon illusion, Descartes mm-hmm. vision, is correct diagnosing of everything that's wrong in the world. So, like, how is this therapy? <laughs> Yeah. So I thought that's like a very interesting thing. Of, hmm. This is another example of the movie. It's not being overtly provocative in some of the plotting, but having this in here is pressing a thread of our modern culture yeah. and saying the therapeutics and the pop culture and this idea that actually nothing, nobody needs to die ever. Nobody, nothing needs to end. You can always have your cake and eat it too, but it's the stasis is yep. part of that. I think that's actually something that the a lot of the fans of this film who politically read a have a particular reading of it um which is neither here nor there but the 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 approach to psychiatry and therapy and therapeutics and um you know what health mental health maybe even is in our current contemporary moment this film there there could i think legitimately you might have people saying uh, it's actually dangerous to show a guy th- uh, flushing his uh, meds down the, the sink and refusing to listen to his therapist. You know, like that um, continuing to yeah. um, foster these kinds of delusions as is extremely dangerous, as we see in something like A Glitch in the Matrix, the documentary. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that there it's interesting that people I haven't seen a lot of like real engagement with the fact that like, yeah, on one level in a culture like ours where we put such a premium on avoiding harm. Uh, despite the possibility of reward, you, you know, risk reward calculations, like yes, you know, it might be the illusion, but the possibility that he's right just drives him so strongly. We we don't accept that in our society, right? Like, yeah, risk, we, they, this would be we, no this risk would be is dangerous. Worth that. No behavior. reward is worth. Yeah, no reward is worth that risk. It's dangerous to the person. He's a potential danger to the people around him, and this film is irresponsible, etc., etc., etc. I just think that's an, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Lightning struck my brain. And this is what hit me. I said to myself, the only way I could find out for sure, the only way I could find out for sure if the Matrix was real and I wasn't losing my mind was to simply pick up the phone and call them. Anton, did you have anything to add? But, but do you, well, I guess my point is just that, so I, I, I was quite struck by the film's um, portrayal of what, what gradually emerges as sort of, right, like the villain's role as being the therapist. Um, mm. But I, at the end, I guess my question is, we've we've talked about this sort of, this move from, I don't, I, like, I don't know, um, I'm not saying that the first Matrix is like a purely rationalist film, but there's definitely an increase in sort of like the importance of um, emotion. Oh, absolutely. And Emotions. I think in this final one, we arrive at the culmination of that, where like the real, like the real awakening is now no longer even even an individual thing, but it's like a 
it's actually like an emotional feeling for another person. So yes. um, Trinity only has her, her uh, awakening in response to Neo. And it's not an actual, it's not even a, a self knowledge anymore. Yeah. It's, right? Which would be feelings based on, on some level, subjective. But like now we've even jettisoned that aspect, and it's actually an interpersonal thing that creates awakening. Exactly, and that's I would so, actually argue that we've gone a far arc from yes, the first film. It is very interesting because I think you know, like you said, the first film it posits that the you know this this nihilistic situation that Aaron describes that that awakening might be, right? the The first film says no, you can actually awaken and you can discover the real the real. Like, it's gnostic. Right, right. It, there's yeah. an esoteric truth exactly. you can access. Whereas the the later ones play with that a little bit. Yep. But this, but the, what this one says, as you're saying, is that okay, that nihilism still exists, whether you're inside or outside of the matrix to some degree. And the problem with the matrix is not that it, um, uh, you know, isn't a, isn't a, a, a fake world. The problem with it is that it prevents you from having meaningful, real interpersonal relationships yeah. with other people. Which is an improvement over solipsism. Real. Yeah, which is an improvement yeah. over solipsism. And the reason you have to rescue Trinity is because, you know, you know, I was worried about how they were going to handle the fact that she has, like, a family and stuff. And, okay, they're bots, good. You but know, it posits like, that Zion is, was even under its own illusion. Exactly. Of the war. But the way of the need for the war. Yeah. Right, like... Exactly. But, and again, what's, what's the so, what's the proper what dynamic? It's an interpersonal be, exchange person. between the robot and the human, right? The or, machine, and to, or to for to love someone, like to yeah. the, the, that's why the Trinity and uh, Neo thing it becomes a dual instead of a one, right? The two instead of the one. Yeah, it's it becomes a, a that, romance. That's, it's it is, yeah. But, the but romance it's is central to the theme. But it's interesting in terms of what we think of as love, because then that pauses the whole idea of again that one of their favorite concerns of the Wachowskis is control versus choice. And then once we're dealing with love, we're back on the whole question of like, is this a matter of control in like choice? Or is this something that like is, you cannot control, right? So mm -hmm. is Trinity's um, decision to go with Neo or, you know, like is Tiffany's rejection of Tiffany in becoming Trinity, is this something that's even controllable? Or is this actually something yeah. that it's going on operating on a level that's beyond sort of choice? Is the meaning of destiny pushed away from this idea of, of, of conflict and into this idea of like romance, hmm. right? It, it reapplies uh. what the kind of um, prophecy and like the, the emphasis of that kind of dynamic becomes. Yeah, I have to say that ultimately that I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that reading and I'm actually slightly sympathetic to that philosophy in terms of like centering like uh you know meaningful relationships with with others as a sort of centering thing and this idea of destiny and free will but i actually think that the film arrival does a better job of dealing with that same <laughs> thing it, it in a philosophical sense of the question of destiny and whether you, we choose it's you just know, a much better science fiction out. film exactly but the, i i would say that one of the reasons why the room so there's obviously the romance in the other movies um and there's actually not that much like "Quote unquote romance here because T uh, Trinity is like asleep for most of the movie. You know, she yep. thinks she's Trinity uh, Tiffany for most of it. But but they have sort of like it's a play on me cute at the no it is at the I, and what, this is what I'm going to say is that what part of what I appreciated so much about the romance is that I think Carrie Ann Moss and Keanu Reeves are like quite fine actors now, and I don't think they were bad actors in the old ones. It's yeah, just I they were so raw. Either. But I think what there is is that like Keanu is always talked about as you know an ageless wonder. And it, he is, but this is the first movie where I've watched and there's like an age to him and a weariness. That's not just John Wick, like being beaten up a bunch, you know, it's like there's an actual mundane despair in his life and that there's a possible out in this, this charge that he feels with Trinity that I find moving. And I especially find it moving with the way that Keanu Reeves plays it in some of the scenes and just it, it's not that I I always bought the romance in the other ones I just think it's nice to see them uh, play against each other in this kind of dynamic and I appreciated the performances quite a bit and I can appreciate uh, Lana Wachowski's affection for these characters and desire to be like I actually am not super happy with the ending I gave them in Revolutions and I want to give them a different one because I actually think that's a bit of the motivating factor here. Hmm. I think she's a bit more of a romantic now and wants to give him a happy ending. Yeah, I know. I, I can see that. Um, 
Yeah, we we don't need to dig into that. I think I think we want like we'd be remiss if we did not briefly talk about the action. Yeah, that's the only thing I want to get it, to. It doesn't work as an action movie. I don't think it's even much of an action movie. Like, there's not that many action scenes. No, and I think to no, me, but it's, it's disappointing not, because yeah, the Matrix it is disappointing. Was is the maybe the best action movie ever? <laughs> yeah, and and like it really. So, <sighs> the, I so, miss the Hong Kong uh, like wire work. Yun I Wuping. miss Wang Wuping. I miss the. Some of the the ways that the original film moved between genres, and they do it a little bit in the, the sequels, if not even emphasize, like the difference uh, in filmmaking between in the Matrix versus outside. Here, it all kind of just felt kind of that flat Marvel kind of lighting, which really works in the real wor- the quote like or that earlier opening sequence that we've all talked about because it's supposed to be the San- boring San Francisco of today, so it makes sense yeah. that it's filmed in that kind of flat digital uh, look. But I would have wanted to see some of the other scenes delve back into like the noir and the the angles but the, and the the, in, yeah. the I'm gonna the I'm gonna texture. push back a little bit on that. It's it's actually not filmed super similar to the the Marvel ones. This movie incorporates a lot yeah, a lot more light, yeah, a lot more lighting specifically because it's not using digital backlots for all those San Francisco scenes. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't have a flat affect That's in true. the light. That's the true. way that I, the light hit no, the way the light hits Keanu Reeves in that is a, 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 it's a key light setup that yeah. is not you wouldn't do if you're doing a Marvel movie if you need to cut out everything right. behind them because but it, it looks be very, way okay, more difficult. I should, I should rephrase that. You're right. Thank you. But for it looks getting, sitcom-y. It looks yes, sitcom-y. It looks contemporary. It looks uh, of our moment in a way, like almost Instagram like photos like kind of glow up that kind of look. So, so that's that's really what yeah. I should say. Not Marvel, yeah, because Marvel's much flatter on yeah. purpose. Because but this it's is, easy but to do this, I think that actually that that Instagram glow up look. That's the key to the, the look of the film. But there's also this. So like what what I've noticed uh, was rewatching the sequels, which I hadn't seen in a long time before I watched Resurrections. Um, right, like in this one, the they're no longer doing the green tint thing for the Matrix, which is fine because it would give the the cat away. Um, it looks but, like the internet now. Also, computers aren't like that anymore. Right, either. it looks yeah. like the internet today. That's but, the Instagram thing. That's why it's so good. Yeah. In that in that sequence, but not in the rest. Yeah. And but I even noticed that in the sequels, they like emphasize the green like way more than the first <laughs> Matrix does. Yeah. Like, Revolutions is maybe because like the, the walls are just like made. painted green. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. But um, but then like so in terms of the action, like my thing was just that like even the way the Wachowskis were shooting action in those all all the first three Matrix is like completely lost and what we're getting here is like a whole bunch of like coverage shots which is what reminded me of marvel in the sense of like Mm -hmm. there was often action in the action sequences like there's no discernible setup and they were i know it's just landing here but like they were known for like these compositions where you have people on is aaron as you've described it an extreme horizontal and like all that Mm -hmm. sort of stuff's like lost and it's just like different angles of coverage multiple planes of action yeah Mm -hmm. No, it's true, and I think, you know, one of the scenes that people are like, oh, well, the, the whole kind of zombie takeover scene at the end where, like, the analyst is like, oh, this is going to be fun. And I'm like, well, this is just doing to humans what happened in Fate of the Furious with the cars flying out of the roof. Like, oh, <laughs> this yeah, has been yeah, done yeah, in yeah, other yeah. movies. So for that, yeah. <laughs> but that's fun. <laughs> exactly. No, and so I think the action is my biggest disappointment. I, I again, can, can stomach it easier knowing that action is clearly not the main operating principle of this movie in a way that the others are where like revolutions has a straight on like hour long action scene and Re- reloaded has the amazing highway chase that's like 25 minutes yeah. and stuff right like you somebody could say i think reloaded is a just awful movie and they would still be like but those action scenes are sweet yeah i'm not i'm not quite there but i'm almost <laughs> in that direction where it's like I think Reloaded has some interesting stuff, but the act that the central action sequence, the series of chases, is is brilliant. Um, but I I I think that um, the action has been devolving ever since the first Matrix, and I think it's the loss of like true bullet time and things like that. Like they stop using like the same. The bullet time no longer starts to work because they start to use CGI to uh, yeah. to do it, and it already is a step down and Reloaded for a lot of the stuff, like the the burly brawl, where it, like it's just it's, you guys love it, I don't. Um, <laughs> it's hilarious, I love but it. What is interesting though, I don't know. One last thing maybe we could say about this is, and I, this isn't a necessarily defense, because to me the the action and some of the cinematography to me is the thing that keeps this from being like a very good to having serious reservations but um 
Did any of you see the uh, demo for the new Unreal Engine uh, that they, the they video put game? Yeah, the video so game, good. where like it almost like it's actually ridiculous, like how good the at least this not necessarily the characters, but like the city uh, architecture and landscape of the driving is almost film realistic. It's I'm insane. Cu- it's especially weird knowing that this is a game movie that involves games exactly. as being a realism and, so, and un- indistinguishable from reality. I think that that I like that they did that. Because I always loved all the tie-ins that they did in the original trilogy, like the Animatrix, but also the Enter the Enter Matrix, the Matrix game that expanded Niobe's story and things like that. Like, so having that is a nice touch. Well, I guess lastly, like the one thing I will say about the movie is that as a comment, you know, as sort of a meta commentary on film, that's maybe one of my favorite aspects of the, the movie. Because for a while, like I, I teach a course on originality, like... I feel like we're trapped in franchise or reboot world. And so I like I like how pronounced that. Um, not necessarily even a critique, um, because right, the film itself is enacting the, uh, mm-hmm. the reboot or sequel. or But um, I like how prominent the concern and perhaps the ennui with like that state of repetition that it's in the I, film. I think we're going to see that angst and that like that anxiety over the purpose of the the work itself in more sequels yeah. going forward because filmmakers don't want to just make the same movie forever yeah like, but it's but it's been, been there <laughs> like it's, it's jurassic world it's the force awakens yeah it's here it, it's becoming the thing you do when you do these like mm. these uh these late or legacy sequels or well i i now want to turn our attention to another movie that came out over the christmas break and that's Adam McKay's political satire, Don't Look Up, which premiered on Netflix on Christmas Day. This is not real. This is not real. This is not real. This isn't happening. Kate, uh, tell me this isn't really happening. I hear there's uh, something you don't like the looks of. We discovered a very large comet. Oh, good for you. It's headed directly towards Earth. This comet is what we call a planet killer. At this exact moment, I say we sit tight and assess. Sit tight and assess? Sit tight. And then assess. The sit tight part comes first, then you gotta digest it. That's the assessment period. Now it's got an all-star cast, including Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, Meryl Streep, a bunch of other people. It acts as a damning commentary on the political inaction over climate change. It's very obvious in the way the movie works and Adam McKay's screaming about it on Twitter every day. And I guess now it's like the most popular Netflix movie ever, I think. Or yeah, one that's of what I've heard. Most I've heard watched, right? We yes, should, most we should watched. clarify. Yes. Watching doesn't equal popularity It's a very popularity devi- today. divisive movie. So like The Matrix Resurrections, I already posted my review. People know I think this is a bad satire. But I'm curious, what did you guys think? Anders, since we went to the Anton first last time. I think I like the film better than you did, rereading your review. But I still don't think it works, really, as a film. It's too unwieldy. It's too all over the place. I, th- I actually disagree. One thing, you know, being aware of the meta commentary around it, I don't think that uh, McKay and David Sirota, the, the, who co wrote the story, uh, you know, Democrat, former uh, member of Bernie Sanders' campaign and things, so he's very plugged into that political world. I don't think either of them did themselves any favors by insisting on a particular allegorical reading even. I think that because the film itself is too double-minded about everything, it, like, it, ha- it, it, ten- it actually doesn't provide the diagnosis of our culture that you would want um, at the same time that I actually think that the central metaphor of an asteroid and climate change as dire as someone might think climate change is, is are, are different situations. Yes. Uh, in, in very, very important ways. The other, th- the th- so maybe the thing I dislike the most about it is how it, it did the same thing that Armageddon does, except for unironically, um, or uh, without the ideology and the jingoism. It actually thinks that it's revealing things. And that is, it, it is so focused on the United States that the rest of the world is, a, you know, they mention, oh, President Xi and these guys doing yeah. this thing. But they really, 
they they really you know they automatically write them off as failing and them only America can really do this whether it's you know a bizarre tech billionaire or the government right so it has this bizarre like sort of that aspect but the thing ultimately why I liked the movie kind of more than you and kind of would give it definitely like a middling review probably maybe you know a half star more than what you did or whatever is that it felt it actually gave me real anxiety to watch because so much of it <laughs> felt like our world. Uh, however you want to read that, I think there's enough fuel for all sides of all political uh, debates and things like that. But it, like, it, it felt kind of like infuriating and maddening in a way that I think is actually what they were kind of going for in some moments. It's an angry yell, as Leo mm-hmm. DiCaprio does how many times in this movie, yeah. or, or Jennifer Lawrence. Oh, would you please just stop being so fuck pleasant? I'm sorry, but not everything needs to sound so goddamn clever or charming or likable all the time. Sometimes we need to just be able to say things to one another. We need to hear things. So, yeah. Anton, what, do, what did you think? Well, I guess I'll keep the fraternal conflict going and probably be the most positive on this film. Uh, I'm not a strong positive. Like, it'd be like, a, I'd probably give it a 6 out of 10. But I, I, overall, uh, I think it's pretty messy. But unlike the Matrix, I'm like I'm leaning towards an over, an overall positive for the mess <laughs> uh, versus like an overall negative. Um, for me, it's just that the uh, it has enough pieces that are sort of firing in the right direction that like the the total effect overall works for me, even if um, the approach seems scattershot mm-hmm. and um, the efficacy of all the stuff doesn't entirely work like the ending uh anders and i watched it together we were talking about how wow like you know compare this movie to dr strange love and you just get like such a difference like you know they they have a they have a pretty good joke at the end of this movie but uh <laughs> the ending of dr strange love is so much more bleak and then also just the way it's delivered is so much better for lasting impact right um mm-hmm. once that joke is worn off like you'll be like you should just cut it when when the yeah. world blows up i think Partly because I, I haven't really been following the online conversation about this film. I approached it as being like, like I, I see that, you know, I guess they were insisting a, a, a reading based on climate change. But I, what I like about the movie is that for me, it's just a, um, like a, a, a satire of so many elements of our society right now. And for me, like, I think it actually functions pretty well in regards to any number of things. And I think there's a lot of examples of... Uh, of the pandemic and response to COVID mm-hmm. that, that fits really well with this movie, whether they intended it or not. Overall, I kind of liked it. I sort of disagreed with you, Aaron, in your review in that I don't actually think that, I don't know if the film actually holds up the uh, the two scientists as highly as you think it does. Yeah, Dr. Really? Mindy, definitely not. I think maybe Kate does. Kate, but, but the movie, here's the thing, is that when you're making a satire, you can't, pull your punches you well it's it, but it depends no, you on can't. what kind of satire like, but not so in the, one that's about the apocalypse but i think i guess what i'm saying is like <laughs> there's different kinds of satire right like if we go back to our you know our our literary genres like the yeah, juvenilian versus horatian but Horatian, like i know right one attack one re- relentlessly attacks vices and one sort of attacks more common human foibles this it's not that this film's one or the other this does but, both um, though, that's the problem right? it does both yeah, yeah i think that's actually part of the problem it wants to like maliciously attack certain people and then other mm-hmm, people exactly like mindy gets the he's doing the human foibles he's getting sucked into the the media verse celebrity you know, and stuff and celebrity yeah. and stuff and it, it wants to be soft on the criticism of him but it wants because he wants his place in the room i thought that was very good the whole like bit that like that mindy doesn't want to give up he's like well, you know we got to go along with it because otherwise who do you want in there someone else not me like this i this idea that we we hang on to whatever little bit of power we have even if we know we're ineffectual i think that's actually could be an interesting critique if it was pushed a little bit more but what's jennifer lawrence's um, uh, character's name again kate Okay, so Blake, well, I forget the doctor's name. And whatever yeah. the name of the comet is. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. Dr. Oglethorpe. But I don't even think she comes across as being, for me, like that was an example of how um, someone who gets so emotionally fixated, like loses the yeah. uh, the ability to actually communicate the message. Like to me, that was an effective critique of, of that sort of true believer who's trying to persuade people, but you're like, you can't actually at the end of the day just like shout at people that they're idiots and wrong and we're all going to die. That won't do anything. I, yeah. The other thing I liked, if I can say something positive before 
some more uh, before Aaron has his, uh, no, his is, cutback. Is, yeah, <laughs> is that um, so? And it's actually related to the criticism, this double minded, this kind of juvenile and Horatian satire at the same time. I actually think that they, they didn't need to go um, make you know Kate and Dr. Mindy as uh, likable as they were because I think that. Like you know, you can do things. You know, Aaron and I are. Both but they're likable the because yeah. of the casting. Exactly. It's exactly. not because they're written that way. It's just it's sure. hard not to like those two actors. Right. But I think that it shows in some of the other characters who, like I mentioned in the movie last night, my favorite character in the movie actually is Timothy Chalamet's character. Yeah, he's mine because too. he is an. He's a. He's obviously a satire. He's this like, you know, the, some of the jokes that he's like, you know, this skater doomer. Uh, evangelical kid, right? Like he's like all over the place. As and he's well. dressed in a but, way that's but he, unreal. Yep. Like, but he's very like, uh, he's like sympathetic, and he's like actually like a decent human being in the end. And like, but those two things aren't mutually exclusive. That he's also a complete joke. So, I think the movie. Well, I think that the mortal sin of this film is that it's super long and not very funny. Even if I nod a lot, where I'm like, oh, I can see, I can see the. I can see the critique. I can see the critique. I know what this is ripping in the real world. I don't think it's very funny. And I think it partially comes down to when you're making something like this, I'd rather not have A-list actors or I'd rather have comedians and not dramatic actors because I think, frankly, it'd be so much funny if Will Ferrell was the Dr. Mindy and Leo DiCaprio. (laughs) No, seriously, just imagine how much funnier that'd be. And then John C. Riley was like, Jonah Hill's character. So. Jonah no, Hill Jonah Hill's actually wavelength. very funny though. Ah, but it's all. He's but, but he's even, so horrible. He's like almost no, it's unbearable. not. The, it's not the horrible. It's it's. I just didn't think it was very funny. I thought it was. There were very few moments in the movie where I can't. Um, didn't see the smugness in the joke. Yeah, yeah. And that bothers me with humor. I want humor to be like, this is stupid. You can just have it stupid without have somebody in the room in a film, but smirking at it. Like I said, and, and, I found no, the no, tone of the film more to be actually. I think I agree with you. It's not funny enough. It, it kind of was mostly a disquiet to watch. Yeah, but no, but you you guys made the comments about like Mindy and Kate are not as held up in high esteem as I think as I state in my review. They are objects of satire in it, yeah. but like, does anything they say? They're right. They're right. They're always right. They're always right in on every the matter of the plot. Yes, not it, necessarily. On, no, but on the matter of the main thing, they're always right, and like, I find it. If you're going to satirize something, like just think of any great satire, any, what care in any of those great satires, is there ever a character where like, oh, if they just listen to him, solves the whole thing? No, because it's it deals with like perverse fate, like uh, that but, you almost like yes, so the, yes, yes, the, because that, but this is getting into one of the real problems with the film is that it wants to be a satire and a message movie. Yeah. Yes. You can't have both. People think those are, that's what polemic. satires are. That's the problem in our culture. I think, no. Aaron, that is a lot of people think a satire is like... Never because, gives you a solution. Because in the traditional sense that we're talking about, it was meant to offer like, you know, a kind of moral correction in a sense, right? Yeah, no, satire uh, moral is moral condemnation. It is. That's or it. Co- or condemnate, right? It's but a like, moral condemnation. It doesn't. It doesn't stage the correction for you. It's actually no. not at all interested in providing. It just a says you're doomed it's if you do this. Simply saying that you you you're all stupid. That's all. Yeah. So the thing, the character I always go to, if you're talking about um, making the character be somewhat sympathetic within a satire without letting them off the hook ever, and the ultimate character for that is Babbitt, in the Sinclair Lewis novel from 20, 1922, and it was kind of like it was his masterpiece that, that won him the, um, the Nobel Prize, yeah. the first American to win it for literature. And the whole thing is in Babbitt, for anybody who hasn't read it, or it has no idea because Sinclair Lewis has kind of disappeared from history as this really important American satirist of the 20s and 30s. He also did Elmer Gantry. He also did It Can't Happen Here, Aerosmith, Main Street, and so on. And that book, he's this kind of suburbanite who has the emptiest life possible and he wants all these things but he has no idea like he has no grasp of his own identity or anything and you're tracing him going th- you know he getting the gets a ra- uh, a promotion at work and he he has these kind of dalliances with these people within the culture and it's like oh we're moving up i'm an upward mobile middle class thing but everything's so empty and so stupid always and the character comes to like a half realization and the realization makes him more pathetic because it's like you're aware of all your faults and you never even do anything about it because you're so much of a coward. It's Babbitt is a sympathetic individual 
that novel creates a good portrait of a real person in the center of a very like scathing satire of kind of bourgeois American society. But it never makes Babbitt like, well, Babbitt ultimately we needs to just hug his family at the end and that's all good. It's like, no, Babbitt's a part of the problem. Just because you see yourself in him doesn't make so him the hero. The best <laughs> Babbitt character oh, yeah. in recent things then would be someone like the uh, Danny McBride in Vice Principals. <laughs> but, okay. And Here's those kind thing. of characters who are allowed to be ridiculous and wrong and bad at the same time that you can understand and have sympathy for them. That's a great sound. But if we, take, if we take the two scientist characters, they're only right in pointing out a problem. At no point do they actually have the solution to the problem, because they're the problem they're pointing out just says that this will happen. Up, this will be the end of this will be it. the end of the world, right? When the comet hits. Yeah. But so what I guess what I'm saying is that the film part of the problem. So you like, Ander seemed to suggest that maybe we need like, there wasn't any sense of how do you have a solution. Um, no, but you Aaron, shouldn't actually do that. Yeah, it should be more ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I don't know. Like, I guess what I'm seeing is like, so what What kind of a movie is this? And I think what we're forgetting is that I read this film is not just sort of a satire. And I, I wouldn't have had Will Ferrell or um, John C. Riley because I don't think that this is the a Will Ferrell, Adam McKay movie. This isn't actually like leaning into sort of the, the farce and satire. And this is actually a piece of, this is Big his third advice. installment yeah, in, his, his, in his comedy political semi-serious films the big short vice and now we get don't get look up they've gone consistently worse so. i agree they also get like less biting so in each one and they get more sentimental and mm-hmm. they get more preachy in each one and so like i think that this is the worst of those three i like the big short a lot um vice uh i liked decently and then this one right like i'm, I'm just sort of a cautiously like I, there's enough i liked in it but I guess what I'm saying is that, like, I don't think, I don't know if the scientist characters are as um, sort of, like, idolized as you as you might think, in the sense that, like, they're only pointing out a problem. And at the end of the day, one of the things of the messages of the movie is that, like, maybe there's actually no solution within this world that exists. But there, but there is. That's the thing. It's, like, within this, both in the thing it's pointing to in the actual world. I'm not even talking about, like, what McKay and Sirota are saying yeah, yeah. on Twitter. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying... It, it makes a one-to-one analog of, like, trust the science. I don't think Don't it trust does. institutions. Yes, because you, the third character that we're all, I didn't mention it's at all. Dr. Oglethorpe. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Ogle, Oglethorpe, who's literally like, we've been planning for this for 30 years. If you just listen to me, I'll solve the problem. And his solution is, like, we blow up the asteroid or the, the comet. And all but of how? All science and people have tried it and it failed. No, no, it didn't. They it would have, but they turned around. Because they send Ron Perlman up and then they stop. They never and they even did it. Back. No, they're but you're forgetting that another group tried it and their mission didn't even succeed. Yeah, but that, because but that has to do because, because their plot comes, wants to write out yes, China and because India. Because it makes Russia this sound. It's like, well, China, Russia can't make a functioning spacecraft. This is about American problem, and it's like, well, actually, if you're making it about climate change, it's about the whole world. Yeah, it's I know, but America. I also think I also disagree with your guys' critique of like the Americanism in it because I think his whole point is that that's the problem. No, like, I know, I but, the, think but yeah, no, I think you're but, right. But it, but in order to diagnose the problem, it has to, or uh, to to offer a diagnosis of the problem, which is a real problem, it has to shrink the the realm of the world to America. But it couldn't issues. do a critique of the functioning of the I'm systems within all these different countries. It's yeah. interested in critiquing like neoliberalism and the administrative state within the United the US, States. Yeah. And I think it, like it, that like it's unreasonable to say like why isn't it investing a critique of like China and no, India? And I don't Russia think too? it needs to. But no. what I'm saying is that in the construction of the story that it makes, which like I ultimately I, again I didn't get into this review, but Anders is right off the bat where it's like if you want to critique these specific things, a comet's the wrong choice. I know, because, but I also don't even think it's a climate change movie. It it a hundred percent is. It's not because it's like the the science is ninety nine point seven percent. And nobody's going to listen to it. And it's like, well, we need profit here, so we're not going to. We're going to push it off until we're feeded to the fire, and then we're going to do something. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do this, which doesn't cut undercut our bottom line. And then everybody who's the good guy in the movie is like, well, actually, at the end of the day, I'm going to throw up my hands. I'm going to live personally correctly, and I'm going to hold those I love close. And that's all we can do. But I think I would even disagree with the reading of what the ending in that meal scene is. 
I actually think what it's saying is that we, in such a dysfunctional society and world, perhaps the best you can do is actually try to be a decent human being to the people around you rather than trying to make these structural alterations. But, but then the script is incoherent is the problem. Yeah. It is incoherent to some degree. <laughs> but I also think that, like, I don't think it's a climate change allegory I don't th- to the degree well, that not, McKay thinks it is. And if he does, an he's actually undercutting half of yeah. his points because the scientists F it up by going, you're all going to die. Like, they, like, their rhetoric ruins their case. She blows it up on TV. Like, I yeah, guess but, but think about Anton. But Anton, think about the allegory thing. And like, and I don't want to like beat this dead horse, but oh, so the way to solve it, oh, we can't just face it head on and change everything when the movie would be blowed up. So we have to make it so that we can still profit off of the solution, which would be like green technologies. But all those are really ineffectual, and they don't actually do enough to save anything. It's like what I mean is that yeah, they, yeah, for sure. Clearly, the intentions are there, and I know yeah, it yeah. works into other things of institutional dysfunction and the. The, the stuff about, like, the TV show, the social media, all that, plays into a more cultural critique mm-hmm. in this movie. I just, like, I think it's a bad satire. Because if you don't, if you can't come down to be like, I know what this is, that it's pointing out, is, like, if it's not abundantly, I'm not saying, like, one target abundantly clear, but, but it's not, I if guess, it's just capturing a malaise, mm-hmm. it's more of a genuine angry Twitter thread rant than an well, I think actual it, I think it's but, saying that everything within the system is not working. Yeah. And I think obviously he has, they're but it guiding it towards they a specific external <laughs> problem. This is, but, but I actually think that it, it's it's If critiques. Meryl Streep's president wasn't just an idiot, they could have just yeah. blown up the comment and the movie would be over. No, but they're I, saying that the way the politics is set up, they can't. No, they no can't but it's because she's, she's a huge idiot stupid. who has yeah. a sex scandal and she's a big idiot and a big dummy. And it's like, if Donald Trump wasn't a huge big dummy, we would have solved some problems. Like, it's literally that kind of stuff. Yeah. But this is why the part of the movie that I liked enough, though, was the, like, media and social media and, like, cultural critique apart from the kind of the comet whatever the disaster might be in individual moments and so the film is very uneven for me but i found that stuff either like disturbing or like strangely affecting enough it felt like real to me um that it's sort of like with to circle it back like your comments with the matrix i I'm, i think i found enough of those uh enjoyable enough to like that i actually kind of enjoyed watching the movie even though in the end i don't think it really works no that's that's totally fair i i th- I just think it's too sentimental also for a satire and a, a stylistic thing, not even a plot thing. Even if you read that ending differently than me, the little Malikian things of how precious life on earth is. Here's mm-hmm. some gorillas. Here's some elephants. Here's some people having a prayer. Here's some people having life together. That is so sentimental for a satire because actually if this was a coherent satire, all those snippets would be of like somebody shooting an elephant, some people like beating their wife. Like, it would be just like, look, everybody in this movie and this world is a stupid moron and nobody can solve anything. I would have, I think I would have actually liked to see the version of the movie that you just described. It would have yeah, been so vicious. It'd be funnier. And like, uh, Danny McBride, maybe in a few years, can make one. Mr. Pocchetti, Congressman, this data has been proven and has been peer-reviewed by hundreds of world-renowned scientists. And we're supposed to trust you? The comet's got your name. I don't, I don't see the relevancy. I mean, why won't you ask the question? Sense. Answer the question. Then what's the question? <laughs> Grow up here, okay? This is ridiculous. So before we wrap up the episode, we thought it would be appropriate to pay respect to a couple icons in the film world who died earlier this month which are uh, filmmaker Peter Bogdanovich, who is renowned as a director and film historian, and then also actor Sidney Poitier, who was a civil rights icon in addition to being a Hollywood superstar. So let's just quickly, just a few reflective comments. I feel like they deserve it on this kind of podcast. See, So I thought maybe start with Bogdanovich, who may be a little less influential than Poitier, but, you know, loomed pretty large over New Hollywood, especially in the early era. So, um... Are there any movies of his you guys want to mention quickly, things to check out of his? Anton, do you got anything? Well, I think all of us would say that like uh, Bogdanovich's Targets is probably under seen in, for being so brilliant. Um, if you don't know what Targets is, it's it's from 68. It was like his first major movie as a director, not just working for Roger Corman, though it was a Corman film. And it, it kind of mixes between... Uh, 
Boris Karloff as an aging screen icon and a plot about him dovetailing with like a sniper on the loose. And so it's all about like violence and Hollywood and how these things interact with each other and what we make of violence on screen and violence in the real world. Yeah, and it's yeah. so it's it's a portrayal of sort of a uh, a loner male descending into psychotic killing is actually just like it, it speaks so much to like sort of like that conversation in the the 20 you know tens that we've had that i can't believe the mass shooter yeah yeah um well it was made right in the wake also of of the the austin shooting yeah yeah Yeah, which is the 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 first of what we consider these mass shootings um mr boogeyman king of blood they used to call me marx brothers make you laugh garbo makes you weep harlock makes you scream Oh, I know how people think of me these days. Uh, old-fashioned, outmoded. Well, not after this picture, they wouldn't. You can't change your whole lifetime with one picture. Well, what have you got if you quit? I guess the other Bogdanovich movie I'd point out that's worth checking out. Um, so Bogdanovich, right, he's always known um, for his knowledge of and engagement and interaction with classical Hollywood, even though he was... Um, you know, of the uh, sort of the new Hollywood generation. And uh, I remember watching The Cat's Meow from uh, 2001. And, you know, thinking about, we've talked you know, on our first podcast, we talked about Mank and sort of these movies about classic Hollywood and, you know, uh, uh, Orson Welles and all this sort of stuff. And if you liked Mank and wanted to see, you know, a, a different approach to um, some of the those figures, um, I think The Cat's Meow is a good place to check out. Yeah, and then, you know, I think it's worth then mentioning that in his work as, like, a film historian and, uh, you know, devotee of the, the classic Hollywood and stuff, I, I always appreciated the, the whole story about how when Orson Welles was really hard up, he, like, lived in his attic or something, yeah. which is, uh, you know, <laughs> pretty pretty amazing. Um, but his, his work in finishing and uh, getting The Other Side of the Wind, the final Orson Welles film, finished and out for Netflix a few years ago, I think that's... Uh, it's a pretty great, and I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think he had a pretty head, uh, important no. role in putting that together because, he, yeah, he edited it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Wells actually asked him, like, if I die, you, you're gonna finish this for me. And it took and him that like, long, but I'm Orson, glad he did don't, it. don't talk about that. But he's like, yeah, I'll do it. That's cool. Um, it took a long time, and I, I feel like we'd be also remiss if, if I didn't <laughs> briefly mention the, the Last Picture Show, which is. It is if great. we're talking about a movie about the changing of the era of old Hollywood, new Hollywood, the idea of like rural America to the city, um, coming of age in that, you know, post Eisenhower era and what it means in the, the change of the, you know, the traditional culture to the counterculture, that movie just hits all those mm-hmm. things so well Absolutely. and has some really great performances. Um, and, uh, you yeah. know, you got to mention his, his role in The Sopranos, too. Yeah, I was going to say, as Dr. Melfi's therapist, he's so good. <laughs> he's so enjoyable. Every, just every scene of the therapy, and I mean all the therapy yeah. scenes. There may be some movies. people who may not be familiar with his films, but you might know him just from that little role. Yeah. Um, as for Poitier, what is there to be said about him? I don't, we're not really the, you know, we're not really the people to make that comment in the sense of what he means to us personally, but he, I think think it's undeniable that he's kind of this icon like as long as we've been alive he's it's just he's the first black movie star mm-hmm. and that's the way and like i i still remember right 2001 when denzel washington won best actor yep. and mm-hmm. Poitier was getting the honorary oscar yeah and he had this whole thing of like i was chasing you my whole life i was chasing you all my whole life and then you know it's like it's a pleasure to always chase you kind of thing like denzel honoring him as being you know in some ways they're kind of the successor of each other 40 years I've been chasing Sydney. They finally give it to me. What they do? They give it to him the same night. I'll always be chasing you, Sydney. I'll always be following in your footsteps. There's nothing I would rather do, sir. Nothing I would rather do. God bless you. God bless you. Is there any of his films you guys would want to point out? I know he directed a few movies. I haven't actually seen those. I haven't I seen Buck either. and the Preacher or anything, but... um. I think, like, the obvious one, um, people would point out, but In the Heat of the Night is actually, it, it is a great film, and his performance is sort of iconic in it. And I remember uh, Dad always praising the performance in To Sir With Love. I have never seen his uh, Oscar-winning performance for Lose of the Field, so maybe that's something that I'll try to rectify in the upcoming months. 
Yeah, I haven't seen that either. I haven't seen To Serve With Love, despite Dad bringing it up constantly. I, I think of Poitier in, um, obviously, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with, mm-hmm. you know, with, with Tracy and Hepburn. And I even remember him as, like, the, the kind of young man in um, Blackboard Jungle, which is, like, one of his first roles with, mm-hmm. with Glenn Ford. Right? Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've seen that film, yeah. And he's the kind of, like, troubled student who he takes under his wing, and then it's like, there's great promise here, and then the tragedy strikes. And so when, right after he died, I watched um, just a movie on Criterion Channel. It was called No Way Out. It's Joseph Mankiewicz's noir, and it's, like, dealing specifically with racism, and, and Poitier plays a doctor in a hospital where these two... Um, prisoners come in who have just robbed a place and been shot and Richard Widmarks plays one of the prisoners and the, the whole thing is he tries to operate on the guy's brother the guy dies of clearly like a brain tumor he's got something that like but he thinks he killed him and because he's a rampant racist he's like I'm gonna get you you know and it deals uh-huh. with it, it's a classic kind of noir structure and he's the, the the charismatic hero at the center of it but um that movie's interesting purely for not purely um if only for like race relations in that you know, classic Hollywood era, but Poitier, even in that performance, which I, I don't think anybody would consider it like a major film of his or anything, it's kind of a footnote film, but you can tell the amount of screen charisma hmm. that he has and the extreme... I, I, I think it's easy for some people to look back and be like, yeah, he was a great man. It's like, I don't know if he was a great man, but he, had, he loomed greatly over Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And what thing that is really undeniable, at least from my perspective, is that when you watch him in a movie, there is a a heroism that he imbues his characters with through his performance that you're like, you know, certain when there's a thing with certain movie stars, right? You're just like, that's the hero. And it's just the way they play every scene. You're like, that's right. And it's not just right. It's like you, you always admire that character. And he had that in Mm -hmm. these kind of movies where you're just, it's that mix of charisma and just star wattage. Definitely want to explore more of his movies. Obviously want to see like lilies of the field and some of the raisins in the sun, things like that. Anyways, there's there's tons of his work to, to actually explore. They call you up there. They call me Mr. Tibbs. Mr. Tibbs! Well, Mr. Wood, take Mr. Tibbs! Take him down to the depot, and I mean boy like now! I'll have the FBI lab send you the report on this. Not that it'll make any difference. Um, so I think that that's it for the episode. As always, you can read our film reviews and features at threebrothersfilm.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Please help spread our reach by recommending us to your family and friends. Um, sharing our episodes on social media also counts a lot, and, and ratings, reviews, as we said before. You can also support the site and this podcast by subscribing on Patreon. Thanks so much for listening, and we hope to catch you on the next episode of Three Brothers Filmcast. Goodbye, Mr. Moore. I bid you farewell. <laughs>